we would put the distillery and mothball it. So mothball is just closing it down, but leaving all the casks of whiskey mm. in the warehouses. Mm. They always intended to reopen. But in 2008, they were approached by a Dutch company called Scant. They were involved in the energy business, but they wanted a wee shot of making whiskey. Mm. So in November that year, they had their first spirit run. In December the 12th, they laid their first cask. So that is a revival whiskey, the revival of the distillery. Mm -hmm. So, although it was 10 years old in December last year, we still not, do not have it bottled. Hopefully that will come within the next... We were discuss just discussing that at lunchtime. Yeah. yeah, hopefully we'll get it. Once Rachel gives you okay, we'll get it on the shelves. <laughs> it's a very exciting time for us. So 2013, it was sold on again. This time it was bought by the Ben Reef Company, which was Billy Walker. Mm -hmm. Billy had bought um, Ben Reef in 2004. 2004? Uh, ben Reef 2004, Ben Reef 2008. And then us in 2013. Uh -huh. So he had the three distilleries. And then 2016, it's also been taken over by a present owner to our brown foreman. Well. I'm sure you all know brown foreman. Mm -hmm. So. We still make whiskey the old fashioned traditional way. Mm -hmm. We do not have computers in the distillery. <laughs> yes, look of shock in your face. Yes. There is one for water temperature, but everything mm. else is done by hand. Wow. The old fashioned traditional way, the way yeah. we like it. Mm. We always say as well, we rely quite a lot on the knowledge and skill of our stillmen. Mm. So, apart from you know temperatures, mm. density, things like that. Our, skill, our stillman's knowledge is very, very important. Yes. And we like to give credit to them as well. We do not supply local supermarkets. We tend to supply high-end stores. And we export particularly to Asia. Because everyone likes our whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a very small workforce here. We have one stillman, three warehouse, Michelle in the office, and me sometimes here, <laughs> or sometimes I've been here. So, very small workforce, one small happy family. Right. Most of the time. Mm. <laughs> but no, it's, um, we love everything we do here. We've got passion, we've got love for our product, and we just love where we are. Mm. Location is something else. Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful it's located amazing. distilleries I would see in the whole of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm biased, so mm. I only live eight minutes away from here. <laughs> so I shall now hand you over to Douglas, who will we'll take you into the into the production, um, take you also down onto the beach, uh, or certainly make our best. Make, yeah, we'll do our best to get down onto the beach. Weather's not as beautiful as it as sometimes is, but we'll make the most of it. I'm yeah. sure you'll be. If you fancy going down to the beach, we'll go down there, and um, maybe we can take a little round down there yes, as well. No I think we should do that definitely. But let's show. Let's go around the distillery first and foremost. First of all, uh, and then we'll, we'll go down and enjoy the, the natural environment. Yeah. Oh, the distillery here is kind of sitting quite high up. Uh, you will see that we will walk down and there is a valley. Um, so got Glen Glass, it's Valley of the Grey Green, Green Place. Valley of the Grey Green Place. And it was, uh, it was built in 1875. Uh, as um, General told us, uh, by Colonel James Moyer, who was uh, a local merchant from Port Soy, the little town that uh, we all drove through. Uh, and he needed, to, he had a store, so he uh, needed to produce, he wanted to uh, have a continual supply of whiskey, so he uh, built this distillery in this beautiful location. You will see that we have some of our orig original buildings from 1875. Uh, in just the 1960s architecture um, of the rebuild uh, in the late 1950s, 1960s. But from here I'll tell you a little bit about the buildings. Um, first of all actually, if we walk back, I'll show you these houses. Um, the next time you come back to, uh, to Glen Glasser, hopefully uh, you can stay uh, in, these, in this accommodation. Um, we're actually intending to turn this into um, a, a type of accommodation and training centre. Um, so there's not much to see today, um, but this is being renovated. This is one of the projects uh, Brown Foreman is investing in uh, to turn this into uh, high-class accommodation and uh, a, a lovely place for us to have education. 
education and, and training. So look out for that on your next bit. Old, the original distillery. Now, um, this is part of the floor ball house. Um, and we, today we use this to, uh, to store our octave casks. So um, this is, uh, we converted that into a small dunnage warehouse, but that's the original floor malting. And as we walk down there shortly, you will see um, an area of land where the distillery, some of the original distillery buildings stood, including the pagoda. So the original maltings with the pagoda roof. to those trees that you can see in the distance. The distillery was built on a on a slope. It's getting very cold so <laughs> this is me <laughs> come here in January. <laughs> uh, you see the man right? very summer. exposed to the sea. So you know what I was telling you about the influence of the sea, even now you can feel there's a difference between here and Glendronic. But um, anyway so this is uh, the original um, uh, Distillery, and we're now going to go into the granary um, where I will show you the, uh, the old mold that I see should be open yeah. already. But this is a good, good way just to see how we uh, take the, um, the barley uh, and convert it into grist. So behind you, we have our, um, our malt mill. Um, now, um, we have um, this is a Porteous mill, uh, so just like at Ben Reich Distillery. We, um, and Glenglasa Distillery, we have Porteous Mills, a very old mill. I believe this one dates from the 1950s. Um, the Glenronic one that you saw today is, goes back even older. That's a, that's a Bobby Mill, uh, much older. Um, but you can see here we have uh, the barley, which has um, a double row of, of, of grain. Uh, and this malt mill behind you um, uh, will, has, has um, it, well, well, I'll show it to you in a minute, but it will basically take the, the barley from, um, uh, from grain to grist. Uh, and if we look at the grist um, here, so it's a combination of husks, middles, and flour. The middles are also something called grits. A bit like grist, but with a different spelling at the end. So we have we have the husks, the flour is about 10%, 70%, 30%, So we have the, 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 the different composition um, at different distilleries. Our distilleries it all tends to be the same. So if we have too much husk, it becomes too watery. The water will just... Um, drain through uh, the, the, the grist. Uh, too much flour, it becomes a bit sticky uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the mash tun. So here you can see the, the process, how we, we grind it into the, uh, through the mill. There's two sets of rollers in the, um, the, uh, the malt mill, um, which gives a coarse flour, which we call grist. Uh, and then we obviously um, have to, uh, to to malt the barley. We don't malt the barley here at uh, Glenglass Distillery. We buy it from a, a malting company called Crisp Maltings, which uh, are um, about 10 minutes uh, uh, west of here. Okay? So let's go down and have a look at the, um, the, uh, the mill uh, in a bit more, a bit closer up. We have a mill which is from Porteous. Porteous was a company based in Leeds. Uh, in the north of England, in Yorkshire. Um, and we have uh, a mill, part of the mill uh, at, at Ben Reich. Uh, I don't know if you saw the mill when you went to Ben Reich. Yes. It looks very much the same below. Uh, same kind of construction. So basically you have uh, two sets of rollers. One set uh, cracks open the husk of the barley. Um, and then the second uh, set of rollers grinds it into the grist, which we were looking at earlier. Um, this is, uh, you have to take a great deal of care to ensure uh, that the, the rollers are not damaged because um, obviously that will affect the uh, consistency of the grist. But also we have to ensure that no stones um, enter the, the mill, uh, otherwise it could be, uh, it could obviously damage the, the, the rollers and it could be a fire risk. 
Um, so we destone um, the, uh, the, the the barley before it uh, enters the mill. And you maybe saw that at Ben Rief. I don't know when you were at Ben Rief you saw a destoning machine. Uh, um, Glen Farkas. Pardon? Yeah, the and a Glen Farkas. And a Glen Farkas. Okay, yeah, most distilleries will have that. And you can see a stack of uh, of stones or maybe yeah. little particles of metal. So once we've uh, once we've ground uh, ground the uh, the barley and into grist, we transport it through uh, to our uh, mashed tun. And as we walk through here, you'll, we'll walk under a tunnel. So above us, so we're in one building at the moment, one of the original buildings from Glenbasa Distillery. We're going to, go to walk through this tunnel into the new building. I say new; it was built in the late eighteen, uh, the late late nineteen fifties. Um, and uh, you can see here, uh, it's actually all kind of, it's transported along here, underground, uh, through this, um, uh, this traditional um, screw. It's like a screw which uh, trans transports, conveys the, um, the, the, the grist through the pipe. So if you follow me along, just be careful, it's a low, low ceiling. Approximately five tons of grist, uh, which we will um, we will mash in. It's about a, a nine-hour mash, and um, so, so quite a long mash here. And if you can see just how traditional the, the, this piece of equipment is compared to some of the distilleries uh, that we have um, in Scotland, a lot of distilleries now have much larger uh, stainless steel mash tons. Um, but my glass it as. Jill pointed out it's still very, very traditional. Everything's done by, by hand, except the water temperature. You can see a little bit of computerized computerization behind you, uh, just for heating up the, the water. Uh, but certainly, if you come round, I'll show you some of the traditional um, valves uh, that we have here at Glenbatten Distillery. So transferring, opening and closing uh, the, the tanks, um, where the, the wort um, uh, are, are stored, the sparge. So this is the, the first water. Uh, so we do three waters here at Glenglasa Distillery, just like we do at Glendronach, but we don't uh, at Ben Riech, it would be four waters. Uh, so Glenglasa is, um, is, is a bit more similar to Glendronach in that respect, but very traditional uh, um, equipment. You can have a look at that. I'll get out of your way and you can take some pictures. Washbacks are made of Oregon pine. Um, usually, um, when we're in production, we don't spend much time here because of the, the, the carbon dioxide sinks, so it's not a very healthy, safe place to be. Uh, but we'll go upstairs and I'll show you the, uh, the view from uh, the, the washback area uh, and you can have a look at the depth of them. Okay, so uh, here, here we have a total of six washbacks, um, two um, uh, stainless steel and uh, four uh, Oregon pine. And we're, we're told that there really is no difference, uh, it makes no difference to the, um, to the whiskey, um, depending on whether you use stainless steel or uh, uh, wooden washbacks. Mm. But the, certainly the stainless steel ones are somewhat easier to clean uh, than the wooden ones. Okay, so uh, the, the, the window is slightly higher uh, for some folk, but if you have a look out, you will see the, the beautiful view over Sand End Bay. Um, nice. So in, in the distance, you can see the ancient fishing village of Sand End, and we can walk down there uh, shortly. Um, you're looking out over Sand End Bay towards, uh, I guess, Norway is that in that direction. <laughs> And um, this little building down here uh, is the original bottling hall uh, of Glenglasa. But behind you, um, you, can see the, um, you can see the top of the washbacks. Uh, and because it's not in operation today, you can get a really uh, good view inside and put water in the water. So we put water inside them. Uh, whilst it, when the distillery is not in production, uh, we, we like to ensure that the washbacks don't dry out. So the wooden washbacks would otherwise be, um, be would potentially crack. So it keeps interact with the minerals in the water. 
and after 80 hours of, man, uh, of fermentation, we have a very fruity uh, wash, um, which goes on to be uh, distilled through in the, uh, in the stills which you just passed. Um, so that's the, one of the key features here at Vinglase. High minerality in our water, which we mash in a traditional uh, mash tun. We've then got the long fermentation in a combination of Oregon pine and stainless steel wash bags. Does anyone have any questions so far? So you know the meat's right? It's, once this is done over here, you know what, it's, it's all separate. You know, I mean, is there a process where there's a mix between the, this is You mean the wash bag like that? Because <coughs> if this is... <coughs> No, there's no difference. <coughs> they, 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 we're, we're assured that there's no difference in the, um, uh, in the, the process, or the, in the whiskey rather, um, when it comes to, um, to, to using stainless steel or, or wooden wash bags. We designed this, uh, this building um, with the, the sea in mind. This, this design is, um, was, was designed, is supposed to reflect the waves of the North Sea. Um, and I, um, I can actually share with you an architect's drawing of the, the original architect's drawing of this building, um, which could be quite interesting for people who are interested in distillery architecture. Because one of the things about Scotland is each distillery has its a long, you know, it's a different heritage. It's built at a different time, or or parts of the distillery have maybe been expanded, and every distillery has its own architecture as well as you know processes and different styles of whisky. So the Glenglasset is no different from that. But now we're going to walk through, we're going to go back to the still house and I'm going to show you a very unique view of the pot still. See you, Duron, here. Yeah. Yeah. These are, it's the residue at the bottom of the pot stills. Oh. Okay. So we have pot tail and spent lees. Spent lees. Spent lees. Yes. Um, so, you can see here at Glenglasa um, that, that our pot stills are both, um, are qu are both quite, um, quite large, broad pot stills um, and they're, they're more or less the same size, um, which is quite unusual. Usually you'd have a lot, much larger uh, wash still uh, compared with a, a spirit still. Um, so we can go downstairs and have a look at them a bit uh, more closely. These are our two beauties. Um, all our other distilleries have uh, four pot stills. Glenglasset only has, uh, has the two. And um, Glenglasset produces quite a robust, relatively full body. It's a full bodied whisky. And um, even though the stills are actually quite high, you know, they are relatively high stills. Certainly not as, as high as other distil uh, stills in Scotland. Uh, but yet, despite the size of them and the height of them, we still produce quite a, uh, a full body mold. Traditional highland shape with a boiled ball uh, in the middle, so a little bit closer in design to, to Glendronish, but Glendronish stills um, are a little bit more rounded. So here um, you can see the design of the bottom of the still uh, is much broader than at uh, Glendronish. And at Ben Reish, they're shaped like onions onion or pear shaped. Uh, so when, again, all comes down to the pot still shape, uh, which determines the style of spirits that we, we produce. Uh, our spirit safe, yep, photograph. So does that make a big difference actually the shape? The shape of the pot still is very important. Um, now, when we talk about what influences the style of spirit a distillery produces. There are many different influences, starting with the water, to the, uh, fermenta the, 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 the fermentation, the, um, the temperature, the mashing temperature, whether you do three waters or four waters. Um, but when it comes to the actual distillation, uh, when you're separating the alcohols, your four shots, your, um, your hearts uh, and your tails, um, this is where uh, we really do rely on the, the different shapes, dimensions and heights uh, of the pot stills to uh, give us a different spirit. So you always look, when you visit a distillery, look at the line arm which is connecting the top of the still to the condenser. 
if it's um, ascending, if it rises upwards, then it indicates you're, right, you're, you're likely to get a much lighter spirit because um, there is more uh, reflux, the alcohol, the vapour um, falls back down into this, the, the still to be redistilled. Uh, so only the lightest uh, vapours uh, rise up and over the neck of the line arm. If it's a descending uh, line arm, uh, so it's angled downwards, then the heavier alcohols uh, will succeed uh, in rising over without necessarily being redistilled. But also, um, another thing to look at is this boil ball. Now, this um, creates a, a larger surface, copper surface, uh, inside the still, um, so it purifies. Copper has um, uh, qualities which purify the spirit, uh, purifies the spirit, but it also um, traps some of the alcoholic vapors and they fall back down in. So this is what we call reflux. If you can imagine, some of the alcohol gets trapped inside this boil ball, falls back down into the body of the still to be redistilled. Now here we can see you've got the, the, our spirit still, very traditional, uh, everything is done by hand. And then our, our spirit safe, sorry, this is our spirit safe. Uh, you can see it's, it's padlocked. Um, and uh, as Jill said, we don't computerise. Some distilleries... Yes. Both are washed still. No, um, this is our uh, wash still, this is our spirit still. This is, it looks exactly the same. Yeah, so I think maybe um, you were, sorry if I started to talk about that when you were through there. So this is what's unusual about Glenglasa is we have two uh, stills which look almost identical in size. Uh, we have much broader stills um, than uh, other distilleries. And to have a, a spirit still uh, that's, that's almost the same size as a wash still is, is also very unique. Okay? So the Glenglasa's new make spirit is very lush. Um, we've got some examples. Um, this is actually peated. And this is an example of peated new make. Um, I don't currently have an example of the unpeated there. Maybe a little bit there for you to. Not got much in there, I'm afraid. Um, but the the lot, it's, it's very ripe. It's juicy. Um, it's a it's a perfect um, uh, whiskey um, for. Uh, for maturation uh, in a variety of different types of uh, different types of casks as well, so it's not a it's not a light spirit um, that would uh, perhaps be quite delicate. Uh, it's quite a robust spirit. Now, so this is torfa uh, in the making. So originally, um, when uh, the former owners, uh, Highland Distillers, were um, producing whisky at, at Glenglasa they would have been um, using it primarily for blended Scotch whisky. Now, I believe it went into blends such as Cutty Sark, uh, Famous Grouse, etc. And they were trying to produce a more delicate, light-bodied whisky here at Glenglasa, but unsuccessfully. And they had trialled uh, using water from further into Speyside, bringing water to Glenglasa to, um, to, to make the whisky. But you can't really do that uh, long term. So uh, they, in the end, they decided to mothball the distillery. And they concentrated their efforts on, I believe it was Glen Rothes distillery in the heart of Speyside. So they wanted to try to make more of a, a spirit si similar to Glen Rothes, which back in the 1980s, that would have been really uh, the style of whiskey that they were wanting for the blends. But today, we want to make single malt Scotch whiskey here at Glenglasset. And we want a whisky which is, but it's full of character. It's robust, um, full of flavour. So, what wasn't right for the distillers in the 1980s is ideal for us uh, now uh, in, in um, 2019. So we were very pleased that um, our whisky uh, is full of character. Lots of these luscious tropical aromas that I spoke about. You know, those, those sweet spices, perfect for enjoying as a single malt, but not necessarily ideal uh, for the, the owners back in the 1980s who wanted a light, uh, more delicate spirit. And behind it, 
uh, the spirit safe, you can see the, these wooden doors. Um, obviously, I think you'll be grateful that they're not open today because otherwise it would be even colder in here. Um, but uh, that is the distillery is completely open to the elements. And when we talk about um, uh, in, we talk about the spirit having a very ele elemental character. You know, it really is a distillation of its surroundings. You know, the land that's um, all around us, the barley, uh, the water coming, uh, mineral rich water coming from underground. But of course, we're making, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, mashing, we're fermenting, and we're distilling, all with this influence coming into the distillery from the sea. And in a minute, we're going to cross, we're going to exit, uh, and we're going to go up to the warehouse and join Alan, uh, where we will um, uh, hopefully sample some wonderful Glenglasser that's been maturing for many years, if not decades, uh, in this, these coastal warehouses. So, do you have any questions at all uh, on, on Glenglasser? You guys use the same barley? We do, we use the same barley um, across the three distilleries. Um, so that tends to be um, the, uh, all, uh, that, that's acquired from, um, from Crisp Maltings, the company I mentioned, that are about 10-15 you know, minutes down the road. So it's very close and we use local barley. Mm -hmm. So we source our barley from, uh, from this region. Um, naturally, it's more expensive uh, to use, um, uh, there's a lot of demand for barley in this area given the number of distilleries. So we have, uh, we do spend um, more money on having local barley as opposed to buying it from abroad. Mm. Um, okay, so let us go now over to the, um, the warehouses. How old are these things? Five whiskies in the category, they got the, the, the the last um, uh, five were Glendronach, 12 years old, Glendronach, 21 years old, Macallan, 12 years old, Sherry, Glenglasser Revival, and Glenglasser Pedro Jimenez would finish. Wow. And this was the winning whiskey out of, and it, it even beat, it beat uh, the Macallan, 12 years old, Sherry, it even beat the Glendronach, 21 year old, and 12 years old. So, a um, wonderful whiskey which is um, just need to be shared with people around the world and actually people, let people taste the luscious, sweet, tropical fruit notes that come through from the, from the Glenglasse you make spirit. But of course, we've matured this uh, for its final period in Pedro Jimé Sherry Cast to give it this lovely dark colour, um, lovely chocolatey notes, treacle, toffee, um, dried raisins, lots of uh, sweet dessert spices, juicy, lovely, lovely whiskey, lots of fruit. And um, this is a non-age whiskey. This shows, in my opinion, this just shows that how wonderful non-age whiskies can be. So if you're looking at the age the whole time, of course, you know, that gives you an indication of style and flavor. But I think this uh, is a, a wonderful example of a, a sweet, fruity, non-age whiskey, which is perfect for the Asian palate. I mean, you've got all that lovely dried fruit um, and, and brown sugar notes, but it has that slightly um, savoury saline character. And look where the whiskey's made. I mean, look at this environment. You know, all the whiskey has been uh, distilled here. It's been matured here, uh, breathing in all this sea air. This is the North Sea. Um, and if you look around, all the, the foliage, the, uh, the, the, the sea grass, the, um, the gorse, which is this yellow, uh, yellow plant. Just look at around, look at uh, around you all. And all of this is distilled uh, into the, the spirit, and it's matured, taken through the maturation. So the cask is only part of the uh, of the story. And this is what I was saying. You know, about 60, 70 percent of the character usually would come from the cask. But when we were talking about a Glendronach versus um, this is this is very encouraging. Very it is isn't it delicious. Very delicious. Every distillery produces a different spirit, so, you know, a Glendronach sherry cask wouldn't necessarily have all those tropical fruit notes that you get here distilled at Glenglasser. So, um, this is a whiskey we're going to continue uh, in the range. We've decided it's so popular uh, that we're, it was a limited release, but we're going to continue to produce the, the, the Glenglasser PX sherry wood finish. Uh, well, it, 
potentially core range, yeah, we're certainly going to continue it for the moment. We do still have stock of this, uh, so if you're wanting to, uh, to have this in Singapore, we have stock available to, to order and we're going to re-bottle it um, uh, in, uh, this year, later this year. So the base is uh, bourbon cask? Starts as maturation, generally in bourbon barrels. Uh, and then we try